Welcome back for another Sector Expert interview with Craig AI Roundtable. I'm Andrea Senni, host of Craig AI Roundtable and founder of Siri Collaborative, as well as a brokerage owner and technology growth strategist. Joining me today is none other than Keith Lampy, president and COO of Inland Private Capital Corporation. We've got a wealth of topics to discuss, including value and purpose of private real estate securities, Inland Private Capital's position in the market, their expertise, as well as the outlook for 2023 based on over 11 billion in transactions in 20 years at Inland. Keith, welcome. So excited to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. I've got to ask, first and foremost, why real estate securities? Inland real well, estate securities. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's obviously a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, I think what what's interesting about you know real estate is obviously a, a fundamental uh, investable sector um, has been has been around and, and and being invested in since the beginning of time. I think where securities and, and securitizing the hard asset of real estate comes into play is is it provides access to 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 smaller investors. Uh, with smaller investment increments, or in some instances, high net worth investors that maybe don't have the desire to to allocate um, quite as much capital to to any one property. So it gives gives the investing public an opportunity to uh, invest in a piece of property, um, you know, with with other alongside other investors, and then it also then affords them the opportunity to to benefit from institutional management and the value creation that comes along with it. So. Um, it really has been kind of a, an interesting opportunity for asset allocators to get get access and exposure to real estate in, in a more user friendly way. Well, makes sense to me as a broker. I can't tell you how many clients are sick and tired of the headaches of ownership, retail centers, multifamily, the, the like, and they exchange out into these DST products and they're happy. Headaches are gone. It's, like, it's better than the stock market. It's real estate, right? <laughs> real estate securities. <clears throat> that all being said, uh, you do have to be an accredited investor to get involved, but you do not have to be exchanging into a DST to invest in real estate securities, correct? That is correct. Yeah, a private, a private securities transaction does require a accredited investor, meaning million dollar net worth, um, mm -hmm. exclusive of primary residence or uh, $300,000 income for couples filing jointly, $200,000 for, for an individual. So there is a net worth realm that, that, that kind of establishes suitability. Um, but to your point, uh, you know, the, I think the turnkey opportunity to, you know, have every, ha have all the day-to-day, -day, the, uh, the, the terrible T's as they're uh, oftentimes referred to, tenants, toilets, trash, all of that is, is taken care of by, uh, by an institutional platform. Um, a lot of different structures that, that are you can unpack in the private securities arena. So we specialize in tax oriented investments, meaning DSTs or 1031 exchangers. Um, we've also structured a handful of qualified opportunity zone products. Um, but you don't have to have a tax driven reason to invest in a private placement of securities. There's there's a lot of other uh, cash available options as well. Well, so as an inv as an investor, I mean, why why go fee simple and hard assets? Once you've accrued that that accredited investor status, it seems like going through a an inland or or other group is is an evolutionary point. It's, it's how you get from I'm the investor who's been building my my portfolio to I'm the owner. I'm a, I'm a past. I'm retiring. Let's say is, is that what you're seeing there? Those that are 65 and older. What's the average buyer or investor look like? Yeah, it's, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It's, uh, I mean, the the spectrum of, of age kind of varies, but uh, you know, oftentimes, yeah, somebody in their 40s, 50s, 60s um, on up into the spectrum. But I think the real driver is is what you described uh, earlier in your remarks. It's um, you know, investors initially early in life get exposure to real estate by you know buying a rental property, maybe something local that they then manage and 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 you know develop or redevelop. Um, and, and then maybe they graduate to a, a three flat, something, something bigger, but not quite institutional. And by the time they get to us, I think they've, they've evaluated the, the, uh, the spectrum of opportunities. And, and it, again, it, it goes back to that access point. They, they are then afforded the opportunity to consider properties and property types that pri previously would only be acquired by institutional investors like REITs 
and pension funds and, and things of that nature. So um, it, a little bit of a, a step up in, in the way of uh, quality and, and you know, the, the risk spectrum is quite a bit different when you when you get into that echelon of, of investing. Yep. But still but still enjoying annual returns, leverage returns. I mean, the, the beauty of, of real estate. Right. Uh, and I hesitate to use Apple as an example. It's a blue chips stock. It's graduating to blue chip real estate investing in these products. So Inland Private Capital's position and expertise, as I understand it, and I know it to be, is unmatched. You had a record setting year in 2021, 1.5 million, 1 billion in real estate through your 1031 exchange platform. What what does that look like competitive landscape wise? Right. Yeah, you know, Inland Private Capital um, benefits from being uh, one of the affiliates of the Inland Group. Uh, the Inland Group's been around for 50 years. So over you know several decades, a lot of experience and in infrastructure um, certainly established that, that, that we've been as, as an organization, the benefactor of. Um, so we've not only had the experience of managing assets through a variety of different cycles and you know history is is oftentimes something that uh, we we across the board are, are students of and, and want to make sure that we factor into our, our our investment thesis at any given point in time but then having that, that vertically integrated opportunity to identify and source new op, new acquisitions uh do our our, our full-blown due diligence process on each acquisition we we, we ultimately tie up uh, financing capabilities, management capabilities, the, the whole gamut is kind of covered uh, through our affiliation with the Inland Group. Uh, in terms of our, our position as market leader, uh, yeah, I think the, one of the bigger, in addition to, to the affiliation with Inland, the, the big driving force for us has been our ability to stay nimble. Even though we're a big organization, we, we, we take a very thoughtful, nimble approach to you know, kind of reading the macroeconomic tea leaves, if you will, assessing what makes sense from our perspective on a forward-looking basis and, and being a, in a position to pivot strategy accordingly. So, um, you know, real estate's broad spanning. There are certain segments within a real estate investment that, that might make sense today, that might not make sense five years ago. So we've uh, we, we've got a fairly broad spanning uh, platform. Our, our assets under management span pretty much every every sector within the market, and and our strategy shifts depending on on what we're seeing within within the broader marketplace. Well, and, and you touched on it the 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 education, the historical knowledge, the institutional knowledge vertically integrated. I mean, you were the the Great Depression. You've been there for twenty years. You had strategies proven out. Market leader today, ten billion assets under management. What are some of those strategies looking down the line now here at the Outlook? Uh, what asset types are the focus? Healthcare, self-storage, I mean, what, what are you, Inland is always buying, is what I always see at ICSC Re Recon, right? <laughs> uh, what What is Inland doing now that's, that's different from others? Strategy -wise? Our, our focus here the past handful of years coming out of the pandemic has has really anchored on operating assets or assets with with operating characteristics uh, many of your your late cycle strategies um, demographic driven strategies really really seem to make a lot of sense to me today especially given you know the inflationary environment we're, we're finding ourselves in rising interest rates you know some of the some of the front of mind uh, issues that investors are thinking about all the time. Um, so yeah, we've we've leaned into uh, residential assets, uh, you know, multifamily as well as uh, your your built to rent communities, which is a, a growing segment within uh, residential uh, in real estate investing. Uh, self storage is another big area of focus for us. Uh, healthcare related assets, specifically senior living, um, and then finally student housing. Uh, the the last three I mentioned, um, and you could probably uh, categorize residential into this category, tend to be less tied to economic cycles, more tied to demographic trends. Um, so when we look at performance, you know, following the, the two most recent black swan events that we saw, the, the financial crisis of 08, 09, and then the, the pandemic, we saw these, these assets perform better than, than some of the alternatives because the demand for, for uh, rentership, if you will, or, or tenancy, was more needs based and less less economically driven, and and that's kind of where we we are focusing on at least uh, on a near term basis. 
So, so as an example of demographic and life events, self-storage, right? We've got COVID, work from home. You had to move your stuff somewhere to make room for that office. Demand goes up. Healthcare, 65, um, what is it? 10,000 people are turning 65 every day. So those non-traditional hospital uses, uh, senior care, as you mentioned, aging population, and then student housing. I mean, we, population is exploding. So that, that, that makes sense to me. Now, just to, to drill down, when you say residential, you mean multifamily, not single family homes I buying. You're talking multifamily purchase. Yep. Yeah. Uh, three, you know, three story uh, walk up uh, garden style kind of, you know, uh, suburban, suburban type multifamily dwelling. Although we have uh, starting in 2018, we did expand into uh, the acronym is SFR BTR, single family rental uh, built to rent communities. So unlike what you were just describing with single family homes, in, Inland is not going out and buying you know, disparate single family homes in different communities and renting those on a one off basis. But what we have seen a, a growing demand from from uh, the population, uh, particularly in the south at so, southeast and southwestern segments of the country, um, there are communities that are being built almost like apartments where, you know, there's there's sprawling acreage, individual homes are being built with a backyard uh, and, and kind of a single story dwelling, but they also benefit from the the amenity package you might find in a in an apartment. So you've got you got your clubhouse, your pool, um, your other amenities, but you but you have four four walls and a rooftop that make it your you know a home as opposed to a uh, a more traditional apartment. Um, rentership is is uh, continuing to become less of a stigma, and so we're seeing the American public uh, rent uh, in the in the later stages in life, right? So we're seeing. Uh, you know, folks well into their 30s uh, as they establish, you know, families and, and, and continue to grow, continue to have demand for, for to, to rent their residences. And, and I think the, uh, the BTR SFR segment of the market is, is really positioned well to, to kind of uh, support that demand. So, and well, and that sounds similar to mixed use development and something we didn't mention. What's in, what's IPC's outlook on mixed use development acquisition and the different projects? So with what's happened, COVID and the like here in the Northeast, at least we've talked about this on the round table uh, quite often, you've got uh, double density zoning changes. You've got this, this demand for more housing period, but at the same time, uh, higher density and ability to have that, that walkability, right? Uh, where's Inland there on IPC wise, I should say. <laughs> We our, our investment activity has mostly been sector specific. So if we're buying a stabilized cash flowing investment, it's it's typically going to be anchored on 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 one finite strategy. Uh, we have been a part of a, a handful of development transactions where you've you know you've got residential on the top top three floors and and some some retail um, or or uh, you know entertainment on on the ground floor, um, which almost serves as a as an amenity to to your point to kind of fulfill that walkability need. Um, that said, I think the the mixed use, broader spanning, you know, urban plans in in newly uh, developed areas is certainly something we're looking at. So, if, if we're buying a pure play residential dwelling, you want to see, you know, how far is how far is retail, how far is grocery, how far is uh, the entertainment district? Is it is it a walkable uh, demographic population base that you're you're appealing to, and and to what extent that kind of fits and checks a lot of those boxes? So. Even if you are strategy specific, you still kind of have to think about um, where your demand is going to be coming from holistically to make sure you're you're you know you can drive your your, your performance plan accordingly. Well, and uh, performance is you know unmatched. The there's a funny story in South Florida. It's and not a funny story. Jim Freed has a show, and I, I'll never forget it. We were talking about how Inland showed up in January bought up every shopping center and by December had leased them and sold them through the different vertically integrated groups. So are you, uh, is Inland Private Capital and, and the vertically integrated Inland group of companies still moving in at that speed I mean, development wise? And, and that may be an unfair question for you, but I'm asking it anyways. On the disposition side, you're just as healthy on the acquisition as disposition, if I understand. Yep. Yeah, I would say from a from a speed of execution perspective, um, there there is such a thing as hanging on to an asset too long, right? Um, yeah. So getting getting in whether you're buying a stabilized cash flowing property, or or you're getting into a development type project, um, you know, we're, 
we're constantly reading, uh, you know, doing our best, our, our best to read the forward-looking uh, headwinds uh, and, and determining when that, that appropriate exit point is. Um, a majority of what we're, we're targeting for our 1031 platform are, are income-oriented, and I would say more, more long-term uh, holds. Uh, you know, an apartment complex we might uh, purchase, put long-term financing on, and 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 hold for a period of five to seven years. But that's that's what, how we think about it going in. But when we acquire it and we begin managing it, you don't we, we don't sit back and and just assume, okay, this is going to be a five to seven year hold period and don't do anything. You're constantly active. You're constantly monitoring market conditions to determine when when the right uh, exit point in time is, which which has pretty meaningful impact on on your ROI and on your your value proposition to investors. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's why it, DSTs are night and day better than ticks, right? You can actually get things done when you need to and adjust, uh, <clears throat> bar none. So you're maximizing your returns for your investors. You're doing these large scale purchases. Uh, as far as investment, is it is it U.S. firms, institutional public REITs, foreign investment, what is what is the shift? What do you expect going into the next year uh, coming in? You know, in, in terms of market demand, we have, st you know, this year, you know, if, when the calendar turned January 1st, uh, it feels like there was a there was a shift uh, pretty, pretty immediately into here 2022. Um, so I think what we observed is your institutional demand is still very much there. Um, I think, though, the the buyer pool for certain segments of the market thinned out a bit, particularly on the, you know, as you got lower in the spectrum of, of net worth. Um, so transaction volume is has waned a bit, but it's still I would still say healthy uh, when compared to, you know, most, you know, mo most historic trends. Um, and, and I think that's something we just continue to observe. I mean, we're nine months into the year. Um, we've seen dramatic changes in the capital markets environment. Uh, you know the, the Fed's moves to, to to combat inflation and to you know the rising interest rate environment we face is something that that we're very focused on. I think all investors are very focused on. But the the interesting phenomenon that I think surprises a lot of folks is real estate, uh, from a textbook perspective, should shift in value in accordance with with interest rates. But what we've seen here, at least the first nine months, is institutional demand continues to pile into a lot of the sectors that we discussed because they are focused on the growth trajectory, uh, the rent growth, the potential for rent growth, which is very critical if you're in a hyperinflationary environment. And a lot of these, the further upstream you get with institutional investors, a lot of these are all cash buyers, or these are buyers with uh, very low cost of capital lines of credit. So even though your your first mortgage rates may, may be ticking upward, that's not necessarily negatively or adversely impacting their their appetite. So that's a snapshot of what we've seen the first nine months. There's definitely beginning to a shift is beginning to occur. And I think that's something we we just continue to monitor incredibly closely in a large way. That's what's driven our our, our really kind of tight, tight, narrow focus on some of the investment categories I mentioned earlier, because we believe these are going to be good long term uh, buys when factoring in the nuances of inflation, rising interest rates, things of that nature. Right. Health care, self-storage, student housing, all all asset classes where you can more closely control that rent that rent roll. You can squeeze out more income and, and adjust as needed. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Leasing structures, uh, improvements. Inland, as far as speaking on lending loans and cost of capital uh, obviously the bigger you are the cheaper your capital but you've also got IP, uh, IPC as well as um, inland green capital CPACE programs leader there as well so as a vertically integrated company is it fair to say your costs for development or less you're, you're, you're just executing at a time and in a way how let me rephrase that how can a smaller practitioner, others in the market looking to grow, look to operate more like you do? It, it, it takes time, right? I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, the founders of Inland 50 plus years ago, I think, worked through a lot of the same the same nuances and you establish relationships with uh, with, with certain financial institutions, banks and, and, and other types of lenders. 
you establish scale, you, you, you build up your own balance sheet. And that, that does give you an edge, right? Not, it, I guess it's football season, so it's appropriate to use the analogy game of inches. Uh, but in, in this environment, um, you know, the, the, the details, those, those really minutia specifics can make an impact, can, can affect uh, and, and take a marginal deal and make it, make it successful or make a challenge deal successful as a result. And, you know, I, I've been very fortunate to be part of an organization that continues to invest in the business, continues to, you know, allow uh, its balance sheet to be a resource. And, and, and so to your point, that does allow us to, to bring transactions to market at a lower cost of capital, um, you know, with, with less, less in the way of, uh, you know, extra expenses that a, a newer company kind of getting started might, uh, might, might experience. Well, and, and, and certain lenders really, they're, they're looking for that longer track record, right? Especially now given the problems in the market, labor shortages, development, uh, supply shortages. We've had so much happen the last two years. And now as we head into this this downshift, this shift, um, we still need those new assets to be delivered, those mixed use projects here in the Northeast specifically. Uh, there's a lot of demand, new construction demand that's just not being filled. As far as outside of healthcare, self-storage, multifamily, student housing uh what what is your advice for the investors out there looking to transition currently if they own it do they sell it do they hold it if you if you're sitting if you're in their shoes going well i should sell and go invest it inland or get a security or should i hold i think the buy the buy hold sell analysis is a very you know it's, it's, tough it's one. very very tough it's very personal and 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 individual and project specific um, you know, that's, that's the, the very interesting nuance of doing a 1031 exchange. You're selling and buying. So you're transacting kind of in a very similar set of, of macroeconomic conditions. So if you feel like your assets achieved max pricing and you think it's a great time to sell, you have to realize you're also IRS driven mandate. You have to identify a replacement property in 45 days and close on it within six months. So yeah, while you're selling in, in a environment, you, you see upside in you're also buying in that same environment so a lot of i think what what should drive the the buy hold sell analysis is you know the specifics that are on the asset what sector where is it located you know some of the more uh uh you know nuanced uh analyses that you might do on a, on a localized level and then there's also the personal uh shift in do i am i managing the property is my roi adequately compensating me for all the the time and energy I'm putting into the sweat equity I'm putting into uh, you know managing my own asset and that's where I think Inland has really uh, benefited in, in our growth is we're seeing you know as, as as folks get further and further in that cycle they determine that at that point in life where they want to relinquish management uh, responsibilities they, they they run the numbers they see what their tax burden looks like and they say well I I, I want to liquidate I want to get out of active management but I, I want to stay with real estate. I want to continue to defer my capital gains tax through a, a Section 1031 exchange. What are my options? And that's when you look at the the institutional pedigree of, of a firm like Inland or, or some others out there and determine that that transition makes a ton of sense from a from a structural and, and lifestyle perspective. Absolutely. At the end of the day, it's it's what are my cash on cash returns? How do I live every every day all day? Yep. So uh, selling assets, I, I mean, pretty clear. It's a case by case basis. Local markets are obviously a factor. Macro trends a big factor. Uh, how do people get introduced, or where should they go to, to first get introduced to real estate securities as opposed to, you know, buying a REIT straight out of their stock portfolio? So private private securities, I, you know, I mentioned access. It is a it, there there are some steps that that an investor should take. There there are certain platforms out there that that sell direct. Um, Inland is established. We, you know, we raise all of our capital through third-party intermediaries, so uh, wealth planners, financial advisors, um, registered investment advisors. Um, these are these are typically the conduit that that, that introduce Inland as a potential option. Um, so I would I would get in contact with your with, with your financial planner. Um, since the it's real estate, but it falls into that securities realm, um, it does require securities licensing to to make sure that you're uh, 
you're, you're educated and experienced to, to distribute a product like this. So there are some steps to be taken, but the first step is, you know, contacting your, your financial advisor. Uh, most financial advisors are going to be familiar with your, your bigger picture financial plan, your liquidity needs, and they're going to be able to do that full-blown assessment on to what extent uh, a private securities transaction makes sense for you on, on a personal basis. Well, and, and so so on a personal basis, and, and this is probably an unfair question, what are your thoughts on these on this fractional interest, these, these apps where it's buy into XYZ? I, you know, I, I may think I'm buying into a DST secure, 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 yeah, excuse me, a DST like product, but really I'm not. I'm just, I'm buying into a, a re well disguised or one of these others, these, these trading platforms. Well, it, you know, in the spirit of access, I think it's, you know, the, the, there's some, there's some merit to the, to the mm -hmm. concept. I mean, it's, it's a way to really, you know, cast a wide net and, provide broad spanning investors access to, to real estate investments. I think the challenge is, you know, private placements, uh, the, the level of disclosure and scrutiny is sometimes at a different level. Um, and there is a difference between when you compare real estate and securities, real estate is buyer beware, securities, you know, is, is a different animal. So, um, I, you know, I would say, I, I, I don't want to say I'd be weary, but I think you have to be very cautious in, in pursuing a platform like that, make sure you understand um, all the ins and outs of what, what it is you're looking at, not just from, from a, a real estate evaluation perspective, but also you know, who, who the sponsor behind the real estate is, what their track record is um, of, of performance. Um, and and, and you know, sometimes that, that's equally, if not more important than the real estate itself. I mean, I mentioned earlier, we, you know, as an organization, we've, we've seen two really major black swan events that that just had a ripple effect and dislocated our industry and we saw some firms that were in the business that are no longer in the business and you know at the moment there's a lot of capital chasing real estate for all the reasons we, we described earlier um, so there's a lot of firms that that you know may take an opportunistic approach and say well i can i can syndicate a piece of real estate and i can i can raise money in real estate and it, it's a it's a good uh it's a good opportunity to to scale my AUM and and, and make a make a good living, but commitment, long term commitment to the to the underlying investment to the industry is important because you you need good strong sponsorship regardless. But when the tide goes out and a, and a challenge occurs, you really really need um, you know a captain at the at the at the wheel or at the helm kind of kind of steering your way through uh, through whatever whatever challenge you have. And if, if you're anchoring on a opportunistic type sponsorship that, that maybe isn't going to be around during that period of time, that can be very problematic. So I, I would just be very cautious in making sure you get all your questions answered and you kind of you kind of do a deep dive in that regard. Absolutely. Making, uh, you know, it's uh, making sure they're not a bad actor or not that they're a bad actor, but they're a well experienced actor. They've performed. They'll continue to perform. Um, economies of scale and in, industry knowledge, stability. Look, um, inland vertically integrated makes it easy to, to understand the left, right, center of it all. And some of these, there are a few platforms I've seen where it's like index, invest here, X, Y, Z, uh, Bitcoin and such. And I just go, whoa, nope. So, you know, there's a reason you stick with blue chip companies and big names when you're putting your money somewhere. So no, I couldn't appreciate that more. Uh, and I'm sure our audience appreciates it. As far as <clears throat> 2023, we're coming up on the half hour here. What is the one thing you would say to the development world, the broke world? What should we be doing? Uh, to support securities, to support what inland private capital is doing and otherwise. Yeah, I would, I would, uh, yeah, I would say keep, keep asking, asking the tough questions. I mean, we covered, we covered a lot uh, today, but um, you know, going into the the end of this year and into next, um, you know, I think there's certainly going to be additional turbulence. Different, I mean, rising interest rates are kind of a foregone conclusion that. That trend line is going to continue. Um, at, you know, most most for folks are aware of the, you know the hyperinflationary environment we find ourselves in. So we have to be we have to be uh, fairly scrupulous students of our market. Uh, we you know we certainly um, 
we'll we'll continue to kind of evaluate that and have a pulse on on the marketplace. Um, but but you know, kind of kind of assessing that on a forward looking basis, asking asking you know your financial advisor or 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 you know a firm like Inland the the, the appropriate questions. I mean, all of that all of that it plays in. Um, you know, I think a turbulent time presents a great deal of opportunity as well. I mean, we've seen that every single time uh, the market started to to turn in a different direction. And, uh, you know, we're not always right, but we we, we believe we have a, a strong investment thesis. Uh, we have a strong read on on, on the bigger picture market. And, and, the, and the good thing about real estate investing is it is generally long term, right? So, so having a, a, a solid thesis with a long term outlook is has always served us well um big picture and, and and should continue to but but our interaction with our marketplace and kind of understanding you know the the needs of, of that marketplace help us do a better job in the interim so so in the in this late cycle phase for those developers those brokers advising their own clients and, and looking at their markets turbulence is on the way are our, our opportunities coming? Should should you be hoarding your cash reserves at this point and getting ready to to hold to sit there, or uh, make your moves now while you can? If I would rephrase that question, I would say make your moves judiciously. Um, <laughs> the, the hoarding, the I mean, the, it's a well worn soundbite, but there's there's a tremendous amount of capital that's been sidelined for an yeah. extended period of time through a majority of this year. So there's a lot of capital that's already starting to come off the sidelines, um, kind of assessing this post-COVID environment, uh, the, the kind of the some of the new norms. Although we're still kind of navigating that, uh, looking for opportunity. But when you when you think about some of the underlying sectors we described, demand for housing is is on the uptrend, right? Particularly for rental housing, uh, for for multifamily, for BTR, SFR. Uh, demand the demand drivers for storage or student housing in, in, in certain uh, select markets. I mean, demand presents opportunity. Obviously, all of this is very sector specific, uh, but these are all these are all kind of the factors we have to we have to keep in mind as we determine where to kind of move forward and 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 place long term long term bets. Right, and that goes back to the the four Ds, right? Death, divorce, dislocation, and downsizing. The demand will be there, so so focus on it. Um, you you spoke before about asking the right questions. Can I put you? Uh, can I paint you into the corner and say what's what are some of the right questions to be asking your sponsor coming in the gate, uh, looking to invest? I would start with the sponsor, the sponsor checklist or, or due diligence. Uh, you know what what's what's your experience? Uh, how have you done in in past? You know in in, in past uh, investment strategies that you brought to market. Uh, where, you know, no sponsor is a perfect track record. So where did you go wrong? What'd you learn from it? How'd you, how'd you respond ultimately to the, to the bump in the road or the wrinkle uh, right. that, that you had to kind of undertake? Because that, you know, everybody likes to talk about their, their home run, big IRR deal. And, and, and those are, those are fun transactions to, to, uh, to highlight. But, you know, we, we preach this with, with our asset management team, we shouldn't really judge ourselves on, how we did our best deal, but rather how how we how we did when we hit a fork in the road or 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 kind of got got a curveball thrown at us and how we responded and how we how we uh, led led that transaction to a positive outcome. That's that's what we ultimately pride ourselves on. So, you know, sponsor due diligence is incredibly important, um, specific to the real estate transaction. What assumptions are being made, right? I mean, you can make any real estate investment look good on paper by making rosy assumptions. So, you know, if, if we're talking about a multifamily transaction, for example, what rent growth assumptions are you making? Uh, what are, are you are you factoring in inflation onto your expense growth? Because we're seeing wages increase, right? So late your labor line item, your your management cost line item should generally be trending upward. Real estate taxes haven't been going down, uh, you know, anytime in, in recent years. Uh, insurance costs are going up. So so on the income side, what assumptions are you making on rents? Are they supported by market research? Are they supported by what you've seen in the past? And are they sustainable? Uh, but then on the expense side of the ledger, you know, are, are you being are you being conservative in that regard as well? Um, and and I mean, I, I kind of just used multifamily as a, as a as a picture. You could apply that throughout a lot of the other segments of the market. But 
but generally though that two-pronged approach to really diving in deep on sponsorship as well as the real estate um i think i, I think is where I'd, I'd start in terms of asking the tough questions i love it i love it tough questions it, during tough times but it's these are all times we've been through and there have been tougher times right so this is as you pointed out this is an opportunity to create wealth to generate wealth because of these shifts because of the demands uh going on in the market as far as our audience we have a few people checking in one of the questions that did come in uh was regarding sec and transparency we talked about sponsors is there a place to to check your sponsors to look at these deals such uh is the concern is how many restrictions are being put on syndicators if any in new regulations I mean, how will that affect the outcome and that might be we might have to pin that for the next show uh what do you no well I, here, here's what i'd say about that i mean we, when i think about the way we distribute our product and it's it, it there's a very thoughtful reason behind it but we we sell through financial intermediaries that have very strong historic knowledge as well as the ability to do that deep dive so these firms are effectively serve as gatekeepers right okay. if there's a sponsor with with uh lacking experience or there's a sponsor with a series of negative outcomes a lot of these broker dealer uh financial inter intermediary firms won't won't allow the product to be distributed on their platform so so going through that vetting process before uh, you know, an investor even has access to the product is in and of itself a big kind of check and balance that I think our, our industry has has benefited from. And, and a lot of the, you know, the market cycles and historic performance trends that we discuss, you know, financial intermediaries, broker dealers, RAs, they, they've seen a lot of the same things. So, um, you know, a real estate investor may come to the table and, and you know, spend a few months or a year looking at looking at the industry, but that pales in comparison to you know what what a, a due diligence officer at a broker dealer has you know two decades of experience kind of reviewing and assessing and seeing how how a sponsor has performed so a lot of that is 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 very much factored in if you're if you're if you're working through a financial advisor um, to determine what the best product is for you and then there, there are standards there are industry standards that have been created so every private placement that inland provides uh its investment market has a track record of performance. So we delineate every every transaction that we have under management and we showcase kind of how it is performing, but we also show uh, properties or transactions that have gone full cycle and how those perform. And as I said earlier, I, I mean, I don't think any sponsor in the in the world has a perfect track record. We certainly don't, but it's, it, you know, it's one I'd put up against any anyone in our peer group. Um, and we're very transparent about that. And, uh, you know, we don't mind talking about the deal that that didn't go according to plan and and how we responded accordingly, because that's that's a big part of of, of real estate investing. It, at the end of the day, it's not uncommon for things not to go exactly as you thought they might when you acquired the property. Real estate investing is dynamic, but it's it, it's how you responded and how you how you made made your way through the other to the other side. So um, there there's there's kind of a lot of that in in the background that's that should be just sort of occurring organically. Well, and, and that that's well well said it doesn't go as planned despite what zoning says how many times have a projects do projects get changed midway because of zoning approvals and, and the like speaking of multifamily and uh senior care uh we've got one in massachusetts that anyways the the hotel's great but it's not a senior care living facility like it was planned so due diligence what are the bumps in the road how did they handle them transparency all things inland example is a huge beacon for um, and education. I mean, you guys are out there promoting content and teaching the academy and so forth, as I understand it. So that's my big questions for you on this sector interview. Is there anything else you'd want to say out to the industry? Any advice you have? No, I think we covered a lot of ground. I mean, I, I guess just to carry your last your, your last thought or, or point forward, education is something we're we're extremely uh, supportive of. It's you know we don't we don't believe we're in kind of a point click uh, buy model, right? Uh, we're we're we we want our investors to understand all all the nuances, all the ins and outs of of the underlying structure 
and, and strategy before they make a decision to invest. Because at the end of the day, a lot of times these are, this is a significant portion of an investor's net worth and a big, a big decision for them. So um, we do our best to get as much in the way of educational content out as possible throughout the market, educate uh, the financial advisors that, that distribute our product and uh, that's that's the big push that we we continue to to attempt to support in some respects that that's that's a big part of what what this uh, this discussion was about. So really appreciate you kind of being a conduit in that regard and and, and helping us uh, continue to 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 make that push. Yeah, I'm happy to be a podium and a, and a platform to help Inland spread its message and its multiple facets uh, between CPAs and securities and and the like. Uh, especially regulation. I mean, without you guys, we wouldn't have the 1031 DST, right? That's what you're out there fighting for, Dan Wagner relations. I want to thank our audience, everyone who chimed in for questions. I want to thank you, Keith, for tuning in, joining us for the show. Best place for people to reach you uh, or Inland Private Capital. Uh, we'll show in the outtake here in a moment. It's down on the bottom left, inlandprivatecapital.com. To everyone else tuning in, thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to tune into the Correct Way Roundtable every month, first Thursday of the month at 6 p.m. Eastern. Download our show anywhere you get your audio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Alexa, Spotify, Stitcher, Pandora, or simply ask Alexa to tune into the Correct Way Roundtable with Andreas Seni. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where there's a host of great content at YouTube channel CRE Collaborative or visit us at Creco.ai. Your all-in-one dashboard to connect, research, execute, and collaborate online. Please do remember to share, rate, and review us. It really does help. You'll see more of Inlanders, more Inlanders, excuse me, on that show. And Keith, hopefully you'll come back for another segment, teach us a little more about what's happening uh, in the private placement world. So thank you. With that, Mr. Mendoza, will you bounce us out, please? <laughs>